Hello, everyone. My name is Ariella Wagner. I'm the founder of Sunray Construction Solutions, a national notice to owner and lien service. We have the most incredible, and now I can really truly say the most incredible software to help all suppliers keep track of their lien and bond deadlines. Uh, today, we have an incredible webinar with the one and only Alex Barfett. Um, who will do a great job introducing himself on a supplier step-by-step -step guide to getting paid. So without further ado, I introduce the amazing Alex Barthet. Thanks, Ariella. Uh, my name is Alex Barthet. I am a board certified construction attorney in Florida. And today we're gonna talk about a supplier step-by-step -step guide to getting paid. So let's get started. Um, you will see uh, today, all of the steps that you need to follow in order to um, make sure that you protect your lien and bond rights, as well as all of the other things you can do to secure your rights to be paid. Um, give me a second. I want to make sure that you all are seeing it. I, Ariella, is the are the slides advancing? Um, they are not. There we go. They are advancing now. Okay, so let's go through today's agenda, um, what we're going to cover. Step one, uh, we're going to talk about the credit application and the credit check process. Step two, we're going to talk about securing the debt, all the different ways you can secure the debt, effectively the credit that you extend. We're going to talk about guarantees, joint check agreements, and more. Uh, we're going to dive deep into the lien and bond rules here in Florida because that by far is the most important security that you are going to have as you extend credit. So we'll talk about the notice to owner rules. Step four, we'll talk about how to comply with the claim of lien and bond rules. We'll talk about some other requirements that you need to be aware of. I'll give you some steps on how to aggressively collect debts in-house, what we see some of the best uh, suppliers doing, um, what's, what are some of the best techniques that suppliers are using to get paid? And then we'll talk about the lawsuit process. Uh, of course, we will answer all of your questions that you have. Um, and the way you will ask your questions is you will submit, you will submit your questions in the go to webinar chat box. Um, and I ask that you, which is on the right-hand side, uh, will answer all the questions at the end. Um, do not include the names of any people or companies in your questions, please. Um, so just keep the questions hypothetical. So with that, let's get started. So step one is the credit application and credit check. So do you have a credit application? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. Um, do you have a written uh, credit application that outlines the terms and conditions of your engagement with this customer? If you don't, you need to. Now, I've seen some suppliers where their credit application is effectively a questionnaire. It has no terms and conditions. So it's absolutely critical that you include terms and conditions like when do you expect to be paid? Um, what are the warranty obligations that you have with respect to the materials that you're or rental equipment that you're furnishing? What about um, making sure that that the customer is properly insured? Um, other issues like indemnity, notice and opportunity to cure, um, all of those need to be in the terms and conditions of your credit application. Next, you need to check credit references. So your form should ask for ideally uh, bank references, um, other supply house references. Um, you can ask for other references generally, maybe contractors or owners that they've done business with. It is shocking to me to find out that um, while the questions are asked and the information is given, many supply houses do not routinely check those credit references. 
you don't need to check all of them, but you at least need to check some. So make a phone call. Um, call the people that are provided. Most supply houses share this information uh, pretty uh, readily. Banks, it's a little more complicated. Uh, many will not respond, um, or they provide a very vanilla response. Um, but you need to do some due diligence with the credit references. Of course, um, you need to run or you should run a credit check. Um, to do that, you need to get the uh, debtor's written permission. So that should be another term on the credit application, getting written permission to run the credit check and use that credit reference and history to make your credit decision. And then let me talk about some other things that maybe you may not be thinking of doing. Um, I would strongly encourage that the uh, principles of the business and business name itself, um, in, including, by the way, if you happen to know the names of any prior businesses that they were affiliated with, you should run all of those names through Google. Don't just stop at the first page. You need to go deep. I would say at least five pages in, if not 10 pages into Google to see what comes up. Google will um, ha has the tendency to surface a lot of information you not be aware of uh, about these folks that you are about to do business with. Um, obviously, if the name is very common, you may get a lot of false hits, so just be aware of that. But unique names um, are likely to generate meaningful information uh, just with a simple Google search. Uh, you should check public records. Um, so if, for example, you're in Miami-Dade County, um, there are two, if not three places you should check. Now you could do this in any county in the state of Florida. Um, so the, the two sure places you want to check are um, the recording, uh, the, the, the clerk's office, the recording office in the county where you are searching. So every county in Florida has its own recorder's office. So liens and judgments um, and uh, uh, list pendences and those types of documents are going to be recorded in the public record. So for example, if you were going to wanted to find that out in Dade County, you would search Miami-Dade County public records and that'll take you do that search in Google and it'll take you to the public records section so you can search by name uh, in that county. So that's one search. The other search that you want to do is for any court records. So you want to see, are they a plaintiff in any case, a defendant in any case? Um, what are those cases about? Almost all court documents are now available online. So not only can you find out that a case involves your debtor, but you can read the documents related to that case. So the way you'll find it is, let's take another example that Miami-Dade County um, uh, is the search you want to is the county you want to search in so what you'll do is you'll type in Miami-Dade County Clerk of Court and that'll take you to the page you can do that with any county the last public search you may want to do is for so if county name and property appraiser you can get a box that will show you for that county uh, name entity or person who owns any property um, in the in that county so those are some great ways to get information, um, both to find information that may not have been revealed and to verify information that was disclosed to you. So step two, let's talk about how to secure your debt. Um, obviously, you have the credit application, um, effectively a contract between you and the debtor uh, according to those terms and conditions. So that's one way that you're going to secure it. It's effectively a contract right. Um, the next way is a personal guarantee. Um, that personal guarantee, uh, as the name suggests, is a guarantee the business principle for um, to secure the right that you have to be paid. So to the extent that the company does not pay the debt, the um, individual will be obligated to pay the debt. Um, I apologize, I can see the slides are not advancing. Oh, there we go. Of course, it's when I say it. Um, so back to the personal guarantee. 
so for example, if you do business with uh, ABC electrician, uh, electrician, and now you want to secure that debt with a personal guarantee, you need to have that as part of your credit app. It's going to be a separate section where the person, person or persons will sign the document, effectively guaranteeing the debt um, of the business. Typically, we see it as a separate section in the in the credit app it's usually about a paragraph long and when it's signed it's signed without a corporate designation so you don't want the personal guarantee to say you know john smith president um because as a personal guarantor they have no title it's that individually know that florida is a very debtor friendly state and if you get the husband or the wife by themselves to sign a personal guarantee any property or assets held jointly um, by the married couple are not subject to attachment. So for example, you get a judgment against ABC electricians, you have a personal guarantee against the wife who was the president of the corporation. Um, and in the effort to collect that debt, you get a judgment and now you find that they have a bank account with $100,000 in it. But the problem is that that bank account is owned jointly between the husband and wife, typically via uh, a designation called tenants by the entirety, TBE. And as a result, even though the wife has an interest in the property, that interest is not, sep you cannot separate that interest from the husband's interest. So your judgment against just the wife cannot, uh, will not allow you to get that $100,000 in my example. So if that is important to you, or you believe that's important for the extension of the credit, then you need to get both spouses to sign the guarantee. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying you need to understand that, um, that that's what you need. There are other guarantees you can get like a corporate or parental guarantee. Um, so if there's a related entity, you want them to guarantee the debt. If for example, you're selling to a developer directly and that developer is signing the credit application in the entity that only holds the property, but they have a parent entity that kind of manages all of their holdings. You may want to get not only the, you may want to get the company, the single purpose entity that's developing the property to sign the credit app, but you may want the parent company to sign a parental guarantee. Again, a lot like a personal guarantee, but now it's going to be the parent corporation. You can get a joint check agreement. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's effectively an agreement between, it's a three-party agreement between you, your customer, and your customer's customer. So that when, so it creates an obligation for your customer's customer. So if you're the supplier to the electrician and the electrician has a contract with the general contractor, the three of you would sign the agreement and the general contractor would agree that every time they were gonna pay the electrician, they're going to effectively pay you directly. Just be aware the personal, uh, sorry, the joint check agreement are, are governed by their terms. If you are signing a joint check agreement that's prepared by a contractor, meaning it's their form, I would caution you to look at it carefully because it may not be worth the paper it's printed on. Many check agreements we see from general contractors are very weak and do not provide the rights you're looking to secure. Um, so you can create your own and present it to the other side. Um, you can get an ILOC, an irrevocable letter of credit. Effectively, it's money sitting aside in a bank account that on certain conditions being satisfied, the bank will release the money. Um, so that's one way to do it. We typically see that with materials shipping um, from overseas to the U.S. or from the U.S. to maybe the uh, Caribbean. Um, those are usually secured with an ILOC. You can uh, ship COD, so you have a truckload of pipe, it's gonna get to the job site, you're only gonna offload it when it gets there and you get a check, also another way to secure the debt. Um, and then good old fashioned lien and bond rights, um, which we'll talk about now. So you wanna verify that you have good lien rights to begin with. Um, so let's just make sure everyone on the, uh, that's listening to this understands who has lien and bond rights. Um, so 
those that have lien and bond rights in the state of Florida for both private jobs and public jobs, this is where public where you can bond, um, are laborers. That is John Smith, the carpenter. He as a person has lien rights. Um, architects, engineers, and, and land surveyors, they have lien rights. Contractors, that's anybody that has a direct contract with the owner. Subcontractors, sub-subcontractors. Um, and then now this is the bottom of the list, material suppliers or rental companies that have a contract with an owner, contractor, subcontractor, or at the very bottom rung, sub-subcontractors. So if I am a supply house to a sub-subcontractor, I can secure my rights to be paid with a lien. Um, who doesn't have lien rights? Material suppliers to material suppliers. So if I'm a supply house and I sell to another supply house who then sells to the electrician, I don't have lien rights. And sub, sub, subcontractors. That means anyone that far down. And, and to be a subcontractor means you provide some type of labor in addition to possibly providing materials. Okay, so let's talk about the next step, how to comply with the notice to owner rules. So complying with the notice to owner rules um, is not complicated, but it's important that we go through the rules so you understand. Because lien and bond rights are by far the most um, significant and easiest way you have to secure your right to be paid. So you need to make sure that you serve, and that means have it delivered by serve the notice to owner no later than 45 calendar days from your first work or delivery of materials to the project. And that includes serving it on all interested parties, including the general contractor. When you use Sunray uh, Construction Solutions, they make sure that everyone that needs to get a copy gets a copy. And if you get it to them with ample time um, and they can mail it out by the 40th, 40, 40th calendar day from your first work, even if it never is delivered because the um, mail is rejected, the uh, post office mail truck, uh, you know, catches on fire and never gets delivered. As long as you uh, have it, have Sunray serve it by the 40th day, 4-0, serve meaning bring it to the mail, uh, to the post office, get a stamp that they delivered, which they do with every notice, it will be deemed delivered even if it actually never gets there. Um, so you can always do it sooner and we recommend you do it early rather than later. Um, you can serve the notice to owner before you commence work, but not before you have a contract. So if you as a supply house are contracted to deliver $100,000 worth of pipe today, you have a signed agreement to do it or a PO to do it, and you're not gonna deliver for 60 days, you could send the notice now after you sign the agreement or get the PO. You can't do it before you get the PO, but you can do it after no, and no later than 45 days from the first day you deliver materials on the job site. Note that 45 days includes every weekend and legal holiday in between, um, except when the 45th day lands on a weekend or legal holiday, then it rolls to the next day. Um, and if you have a direct contract with an owner, you don't need to send the notice to owner, but I strongly encourage that you do that anyways. Sending a notice by itself is a wonderful collection tool. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next step, which is complying with the claim of lien and bond rules. So what are the rules? You have to uh, record your claim of lien no later than 90 calendar days from your last day of work or last delivery of materials to the project. To the extent you are making a bond claim because the general contractor has a payment bond on the project, whether it's public or private, you need to serve that notice of non-payment no later than again, 90 calendar days from your last work or delivery of materials on the project. Remember that 90 days is not three months. Some months have more than 30 days. Some months have fewer than 30 days. Um, so you, you shouldn't be counting on your fingers um, by month. So uh, July 7th, August 7th, um, you're, that's not the way you count. You need to count 90 calendar days. It includes every weekend and, and holiday in between. 
um, except when the 90th day lands on a weekend or legal holiday, then it rolls to the next day. So if the 90th day is a Saturday, you go to Sunday, which means you go to Monday. And if Monday, for example, is a day where the courts are closed, then you roll to the, to the Tuesday. Um, you don't have to wait until you deliver all of the material or finish all your work to record your lien. You can record it while you're still working on the project. And people do that if they aren't getting paid timely as a collection tool. Last work does not include punch list or warranty work. So as a supply house, what does this mean? You deliver um, $100,000 worth of pipe. One of the pipes happens to be defective. So three weeks later, you go back out and you replace the defective pipe with a good pipe. You didn't send a new bill. It's not new pipe, it's not extra pipe, not different pipe. Your last day of work is when you delivered the, the load of pipe, not when you came back and delivered the replacement pipe to fix the defect. It does include approved change order work. So if I order $100,000 worth of pipe and I need to order another $2,000 worth of pipe, that new order would now be my new last day. Um, so let's talk step five about some other lean and bond requirements that you need to be aware of. Um, if you have a direct contract with the owner and you have lien rights, then you need to serve what's called a contractor's final affidavit. Now, as a supply house, you don't need to do this. As a subcontractor, you do. But if, again, if you are just a supply house, meaning you only provide materials, no labor, you don't need to, to serve this last five-day contractor final affidavit. If you receive a request for sworn statement of account, you need to timely respond to those requests so that you don't lose your lien rights. Um, if the notice of commencement is terminated, meaning it uh, is canceled because maybe they're refinancing the project, maybe they are hiring a new contractor, you should get that notice of termination in the mail via certified mail. And when you do, just know that any amounts of money that you're owed from that day back, you only have 30, 30, 30 calendar days to serve your lien, not 90. So if you get that notice of termination um, and you did work 10 days ago, your last delivery was 10 days ago, um, you now only have three more days to record your lien. You don't have names from your last work. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about how some of these deadlines can be shortened, the one year from the, the time to file the lawsuit. So step six, let's talk about some steps that you can use to aggressively collect the debt in-house. Um, so the first thing is recognizing that you have an outstanding balance. You should be routinely reviewing your um, accounts receivable, uh, I would say weekly, if not bi-weekly. Um, and by reviewing them, you'll identify who's late. You should be calling them. You should be sending them emails at least once a week, maybe several times a week. Um, the more effort you put on it, the more likely you are to get paid. Consider cutting off other jobs to this um, customer if they cannot make good on their payment. Um, many supply houses do this um, and that's how they exert their greatest leverage. Oh, you aren't paying on this account. You can't bring it current. Um, you know what? We're just not going to sell to you on any other account. Um, consider an office visit, you know, stopping in. Hey, I need to pick up a check. Now that's a little harder because of the coronavirus, but it's not impossible. Um, so make sure that you are um, being aggressive in your collection efforts. You can be courteous, but you still need to be aggressive. Once you lean or serve a notice of non-payment, that kind of opens the door for other people you can call. So for example, once you record a lien as a supply house, now you can call the contractor, you can send the contractor email, you can call the owner, you can send the owner emails, because now you have a direct claim against them because of your lien. If someone wants to pay you a partial payment, absolutely you should accept it. Um, just be absolutely certain that you read the release that they're asking you to sign. So if you're owed 50,000 and they're gonna pay you 30, make sure when you sign a partial lien release for the 30, 
that you're not releasing rights beyond the $30,000 that you're getting. So, um, for example, if you're owed 50000 and that covers your deliveries through June 7th, then you need to make sure that your release is only good through June 7th. If, if it's unclear at all in this document, then you need to create some exceptions. You know, um, this release does not release uh, $20,000 of our lien rights, um, which remain in effect for invoice number, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you have to create exceptions in the, in the document to make sure you don't give up those lien rights, you need to do it. Last step, filing a lawsuit to foreclose on your lien. Um, you need to file the lawsuit to foreclose on your lien no later than one calendar year from the day you were the claim of lien. If you have a claim on a payment bond, public or private, you need to file your lawsuit on that bond claim no later than one year from um, your last work on the job, not from the date of that notice of non-payment. So there's a distinction of time, meaning you have a little bit more time for a lien foreclosure than you do for a bond foreclosure. Um, that being said, you should not be waiting that long anyways. Um, we recommend that you should start the lien process at about 60 days from your last work on the job. So give or take 60 days, if you haven't been paid, you should start the lien or bond process. If after you record a lien or serve a notice of non-payment for the next 60 days, your internal aggressive efforts haven't produced payment, that's when we recommend that barring some other business reason, you aggressively pursue your debt through the court system. Um, there are ways for the contractor or the owner to shorten these one-year periods, and that's by what's called a notice of contest of lien, which reduces it to 60 days. You'll get a document in the mail via certified mail saying, hey, so no notice of contest of lien, you have 60 days from this date to, if you don't do it in 60 days, you lose your lien or bond rights. Sometimes they'll do it even, they'll do it, they'll try to do it even faster. So they'll issue what's called a summons to show cause which reduces it to 20 days. This is a document that will be served upon you by a, a process server or the sheriff. It's actually a lawsuit. And now you only have 20 days. Be careful upon receiving any of those documents because if you don't act quickly, you will lose your lien rights. Um, you can always sue for other claims, breach of contract, um, which may be the credit app or the personal guarantee or the parental guarantee. Uh, unjust enrichment, meaning I gave you materials of value and you haven't paid for them. And then there may be some other more creative legal claims depending on your scenario, um, but these are definitely the most common that we see. Um, so with that, uh, Ariella, do we have any questions that I can answer for anybody? Um, at the moment, no, we do not have any questions. Okay, so let's talk about the next seminar, assuming the slide shows up here. Um, so our next webinar, we do these once a month, uh, is on September 17th, so a month from now, uh, and it's titled, Your Lean is Worthless uh, on Tenant Build-Out Work. Um, here's why and what you can do about it. So we'll talk about the intricacies of lien rights as they apply to tenant build out work and why you need to be extra careful when you do tenant build out work um, either as a subcontractor contractor or supplier um, and other ways you can protect your rights um, hopefully this last slide will eventually show up and um, it has ariella's contact information and my information um, so if you have any questions, you can send us an email. Ariella, any other final comments? Um, perhaps you can maybe press one more time to the next slide because it's not appearing for everyone to view. Yes. There we go. It, there we go. Okay. Um, um, there actually is one question. Yes, okay. um, we can. We will be sending out a um, 
someone's asking for a printable version of the webinar, yes, you will have a printable version of the webinar. We could send that out to you. And in addition, within the next week, you'll also receive a copy of the webinar if you wanted to share it with your colleagues so they can understand the step-by-step -step guide to getting paid. Perfect. Thank you, Ariella. I appreciate the opportunity. And again, if any one of you have other questions, just send Ariella or me an email. Um, you know what? There is one more question, if we can answer this. It just came sure. through. Okay. Seeing a lot of lean releases. Um, and I do want to make sure, um, everyone, that if we're discussing waivers and releases, that it's specific to the state of Florida. So the question here is um, because there are some states, such as California, for example, that doesn't require a notary. So seeing a lot of lien releases come through don't require signatures to be notarized. Is notarization necessary? So if this is specific, yeah, um, to the person that asked that, if that's specific to Florida, then that is not a valid waiver and release. It has to be notarized. And if Alex wants to continue. Yep. Yeah. With one exception, Ariella, um, so almost always we at least see, and I'm guessing Ariella does as well, we see lien releases notarized, um, meaning there's a spot for a notarization. Um, the, uh, the form itself doesn't necessarily need to be notarized to be valid in the sense that it will be valid according to its terms, um, but I would say 99 out of 100 releases that we see are in fact um are in fact notarized and remember anytime you want to take anything to the clerk to record they will only accept something that is notarized which is primarily the reason why almost all of them are uh have a notary spot on it in case anyone wants to take them to the recorder's office and i want to just specify one thing um for this question are you speaking specifically of a, because the, the words are, can be extremely confusing. Is that, are you speaking of a satisfaction of a lien or are you speaking of waivers and really uh, the waiver and releases to a notice to owner? So the sat I, let me, let me interject one thing. So the satisfaction absolutely has to be notarized. And the reason is that a satisfaction is intended to be recorded and the clerk will only accept a notarized document. Correct. So satisfactions absolutely positively must be notarized. I just wanted to make sure that we clarified that question um, to, for the, for the um, viewer. No problem. If any, again, if anyone has other questions, just send us an email. We'll go ahead and answer them um, within one business day. Okay, last one. <laughs> In order to foreclose on a lien, um, do you have to hire an attorney? Um, so if you are an individual um, in, uh, in the state of Florida as a lien or, so if, if I have a lien as a person, I don't need to be represented by counsel. Uh, the rules in, in the state of Florida require that if you are a business, any lawsuit filed outside of small claims court, you as a business, either as the plaintiff or the defendant, must be represented by counsel. The rules for small claims cases were recently changed, and now it used to, for many years, it used to be a jurisdictional limit of $5,000. Now it is $8,000. So if I am a supply house and I have a lien and I'm owed $8,000 or less, you should be able to bring that claim in small claims court yourself without the need for a lawyer. Anything more than that, you would need to hire a lawyer because then you need to bring it in either county court or circuit court, which has a higher dollar amount for the claim. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And again, if there are any other questions, feel free to email us at any time. I wish everyone a uh, safe, ha healthy, and happy rest of your week. And once again, Alex, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, webinar. No problem. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.